Well, good evening. I, uh, I'm not mic'd up tonight because I'm not teaching tonight. We continue in the summer here, having opportunities to hear some uh, different men bring the word of God. Now, many of you have had a chance to hear our speaker tonight, Angus Iglesias. Uh, he's taught here before, and uh, we're happy to have him here once more. And uh, I've known Angus now for several years, and a uh, man who loves the Lord, loves his family, uh, loves the Word of God, and loves teaching the Word of God. So we're happy to have him here. Angus, it's all yours. Studying the Bible, you know, when it says when it shows that word therefore, you gotta look and see what it's there for, right? You wanna look at some previous verses and look at previous scriptures to see um, why the apostle Paul is in his camp telling them to stand firm. So what we want to do is we're gonna look at verses 17 to 21 of chapter 3. And we'll go through this um, just a little bit here just so we can get a better understanding again of why the apostle Paul is telling the Philippian church to stand firm. 
So in verse 17 of chapter 3, it says, Brothers, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of Christ, of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. So here in verses 17 through 19, we see a contrast, right, a difference of how Paul's encouraging the believers in Philippi to act and how to live. You see, there was this group during that time called the Judaizers, and, you know, with what they believe, I mean, they're still in this group today, but maybe they're not called Judaizers, but back then what they believed was that they refused to believe that God offers salvation free, that God offers salvation free to those that will believe in Christ Jesus. They thought that the self, the gift of salvation and forgiveness required some sort of payment from their life. I mean, they thank God for his grace, but they also thought that his grace wasn't free, and that they somehow had to make payments towards God for his grace. And that's kind of where those works came in, right? And the Judaizers thought that, hey, if I follow the Mosaic law and add in these works um, as much as I can, that that will help God back for his grace and actually help them in their salvation. And what they would do within the Mosaic law was they would abstain from eating certain food, right? They wouldn't eat certain things. And if they did that, then that would please God and that would help him pay back him, God for his grace. Another thing. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and another thing. All right. And another thing that they would do, that they would try to follow the Mosaic law, is get circumcised, right? They think, hey, you know, if I did this as well, then that would please God. And it helped me be able to pay back God for the grace that he's given me. But you see, when people start adding works to God's grace, it actually takes away from God's grace. It diminishes God's grace. It's no longer grace, right? It's no longer free. It's no longer given. But now they're working for their salvation. They're trying to earn their way to heaven. But Paul tells the Philippians, do not follow these false teachings. Do not follow these religious ways of thinking that you could earn your way to heaven. He tells them not to follow these false ways because their end is destruction. And that they're actually enemies of the cross of Christ. I mean, that's a strong statement right there, to be an enemy of the cross of Christ. I mean, nobody wants to be that. But when they start believing these things, that's what they become, is the enemy of the cross of Christ. And that's how important it is, again, for us, for them not to diminish, diminish God's grace or take away from God's grace or take away from what Jesus did on the cross. But that's exactly what they were doing because they were putting their faith in their own works. They were glorifying themselves because of how many good things they did, and that they were filling their minds with ideas of what other good things can I do in order to be more saved, or what other things can I do to secure my salvation. But Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, he says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law can make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. And so we see here, Paul's addressing this very issue, right? He's saying, I don't treat God's grace meaningless. Because when we start adding things to the finished work of Jesus Christ, to God's grace, it makes God's grace lower. It diminishes it. It, it has no meaning. That's what it says. Exactly. It's meaningless. And he even addresses the issue. He says, for if keeping the law can make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. If I could earn my way to salvation, if I could do good works, if I could do this good and that, and I could, you know, help assist in my salvation, then why did Christ die? He cried for no reason. He died for no reason. It's not 95% God's grace and 5% us. It's either 100% Christ and, and believing and put your faith in his works, or it's nothing. Because when we start adding our own works to God, 
and his work and his grace, it takes away, it's meaningless. So we have to understand that God doesn't need our help, but we need God's help. So again, Paul tells the Philippians, do not look towards these false teachers. Do not look towards their false ways. Don't look to them for an example of how to live your life, but stay true to what they were taught. Stay true to what they were taught by Paul. Stay, stay true to what they were taught by their church leaders, which were Timothy and Epaphroditus. And to first keep your eyes on the Lord and then look to your leaders that God's given them, right? God's given them these leaders to give them godly advice or even to look to their leaders for godly examples in their life of how they live their life, to look at them as an example. Hey, how do, how do they do this? How do they do that? You know, how are they handling these situations? How are they handling these trials? And that's why God's given them these leaders, because those leaders, they'll point them to God. They'll encourage them to stand firm in their faith, their faith that is rooted and it's grounded in Jesus Christ. And the leaders will encourage them to stand firm in what Jesus did on the cross and only what Jesus did on the cross. And they'll stand firm in Jesus' works because Jesus' works are sufficient for salvation. Their leaders will also encourage them to stand firm in filling their minds with heavenly things instead of looking towards worldly things or things that they could work their way to salvation, right? Because those things aren't pleasing to God. But we also see here um, what else the believers are able to stand firm in verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3. It says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So as you know, as a citizen of somewhere, I mean, that means that you legally belong to that country, right? That you have the privileges, you have the rights. I mean, you even have the protection of that country. But in order for us to understand this a little bit better in a spiritual sense, and to even strengthen mine and your um, standing in the Lord as a citizen of heaven, what we want to do first is we want to understand that by birth, right, we weren't born as citizens of heaven, but we were actually born into the kingdom of this world, which Satan currently rules. And we were enslaved as citizens of this evil world with having our hearts and our minds darkened. And even with that you know, heart and mind darkened and blinded, we follow the evil ways of the sinful ways, right, of the devil. But that was only until by God and his grace opened our eyes. When he opened our eyes to see our sin, and by his grace, he gave us the gift of salvation. He, under, he opened our eyes to see our sin for what it was, and he made, me, made us understand that we need to repent for our sins, right? And he gave us new life. We're new creation. We're now citizens of heaven. And we have all that through his only son, Jesus Christ. So you see, if you've repented of your sins and put all of your faith in Jesus Christ as your savior, then now you're born again. Now you're born of the kingdom of heaven, right? Now you're a citizen of heaven. So now you legally belong to heaven. And that's where your home is. Your true home is in heaven. It's not in this world anymore. Your true home's in heaven with the Lord. But I mean, even now, in not, us not being with the Lord, we still currently receive the blessings of being a child of God. We receive the blessings of being a citizen of heaven, the privileges, right? And so some of those blessings that we receive is first is like God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And he lives within us. He transforms our minds, right? He, he changes our minds from how we used to think to how we think now to us desiring more of the Lord. He changes our hearts, our souls, so that we want to li now live a life that's pleasing to God and no longer live that life that, that was full of sin and to desire things that his de he desires. And the Holy Spirit teaches us the word of God gives us understanding to the word of God. When we spend time in the word, reading the word, 
growing us in our relationship with God. And he also gives us discernment and knowledge to recognize any false teachings that might come up in our life. That we might hear from, you know, people on TV or people on the radio. Right now I don't know about the radio anymore. That was back in the day. <laughs> but um, um, people on TV, you know, people on your phone or things like that, even your friends, to recognize those false teachings. But he'll also give us the strength, the Holy Spirit will give us the strength to stand firm in our faith when we face those trials, when we face those challenges, when you might face any persecution that you have within your life for being a Christian, for living a life that's glorifying to God. So you see, you're able to stand firm in knowing that you belong to God. You're able to stand firm knowing that you have the Holy Spirit of God that lives and dwells within your life, within your soul. And you're able to stand firm knowing that your home is in heaven with the Lord. And when the word of God here tells us to stand firm, it's actually a military command. It's not just a suggestion like, oh, you know what, within your life, stand firm in the Lord if, if you have time to. But no, it's a, it's a command from God to stand firm in the Lord. And that's the way it's written in the original language, as a present active imperative, which means that it's of the most vital importance, that we must always and actively stand firm in the Lord. We must dig our heels in. We must remain steadfast. We must persevere. We must move forward in the Lord, not quitting, not giving up. Because living this Christian life, it's a battle, right? It's a spiritual battle that we face every single day. And that's why we must stand firm in the Lord. We must find our strength in the Lord. You know, I mean, talking about standing firm in the Lord and knowing that we as Christians, that we're in this spiritual battle, this makes me think of, of one of the battles that I've read before uh, from the Korean War. And this battle, it took place at the Chosen Reservoir. And so this battle that took place, I mean, it was an intense battle. I mean, not only because of the difficult terrain that was there or like the hills and all that and the enemy was there, but I mean, it was so cold that it was 25 degrees below zero. And imagine trying to fight a battle like that cold, trying to bundle up, but still worrying about who, where you're getting shot at and stuff like that. But I mean, this battle again, took place at the Chosen Reservoir, and this Marine colonel was there, and he was leading the 1st Marine Division. This Marine colonel, his name was Lewis Burwell Pooler, also known as Chesty Pooler. Some of you guys might know him. I'm not sure how many of you guys heard of him, but Chesty Pooler, that's what he's known as to the Marines, and first you have to understand a little bit about Chesty Pooler and who he was. I mean, he was a Marine's Marine, right? He was a hard charger. He didn't want to run away from the battle, but he ran towards the battle. There was no sign of defeat within his mind. He always was a hard charger and always looking to defeat the enemy and to destroy the enemy. When they give him a mission, he went out there and he conquered it. And so, again, they were dispatched to the Chosen Reservoir. And not long after they arrived and set up base, the enemy started attacking their position. I mean, they're from everywhere. Right? They were wounding people, they were destroying their equipment, they were killing people, and the next thing they knew, they were surrounded by the enemy, taking fire from every single side, front, back, side, left, right, everything. And so on December 6, 1950, Colonel Chesty Pooler was ordered to create a way out for everybody that was surrounded. And he wanted to create a way out so obviously they could get out and not be killed, but when Colonel, the Colonel got his Marines together without having any sur uh, surrender in his mind and knowing who Chesty Puller was, it wasn't where he was like, okay, well, we're surrounded, so let's just, we're, we're defeated. Because he was like after the enemy. He was there to conquer the enemy. So when he, they ordered him to get out, what he said to his Marines, he got them together and he said, men, they're on our left, they're on our right, they're in front of us, they're behind us. They can't get away this time. They can't get away this time. And so that's his perspective though, right? Not that he's surrounded like, oh, I'm scared now. Like, let's just give up. No, he's looking. 
He's looking towards destroying the enemy. He knows what he has to do. And so the Marines, they stood firm. They fought the enemy. They dug their hills in. They persevered within the battle. They destroyed the enemy. They conquered the enemy. And ultimately, they moved forward towards victory, creating that way out for all the wounded, for the equipment, for even the dead so they could bring them home to bury them. And the reason that I bring this story up, though, is because even though this was a physical battle, I mean, we as Christians, we face a spiritual battle, again, every single day. And the, men, the enemy that we face is a spiritual enemy. But that spiritual enemy is looking to devour us. It's seeking to devour us. Constantly attacking us. Where we feel surrounded when we're in that spiritual battle. Where we're taking fire from every single direction within our life sometimes. Where we, we're taking spiritual fire from the front, from the back, from the side, everything. Like some days... It just happens all the time, right? It's just that day. But <clears throat> we as Christians, we need to persevere in the battle. We need to be strengthened by the Lord, not giving up. Because even though the enemy can't separate us from the Lord because we're secure in the Lord, he wants to stumble us. He wants to take our focus off of the Lord. He wants us to focus on the battle and be distracted, not to, find, not to be in prayer, not to be strengthened by the Lord, not to be in the word of God, not to be encouraged and strengthened by God's word. So we, as Christians, we need to know that we need to stand firm in the Lord. We need to stand firm in his power and his strength for our spiritual battles. We need to know that we, as Christians, as citizens of heaven, have been blessed. We've been blessed with the weapons that we need for this spiritual battle. So let's go ahead and we'll look at Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll see how we're equipped for the spiritual battle. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we see here that we're supposed to be strong in the Lord. We're supposed to find our strength in Him. And not in our own strength, right? But it says right here to find our strength in Him and find his, to have His strength, the strength of His might, not our own might, not where we sum up some kind of power within us to fight these spiritual battles. Because again, it's not a physical battle that we fight. It's a spiritual one, so we need his might. And he gives us the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil because those schemes are always out there. They're trying to stumble us. They're trying to tempt us to be falling into sin. And again, it addresses who we fight. We fight against, not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, present darkness, those kind of things that we need to fight against every single day. So as Christians, as citizens of heaven, we've been blessed with weapons, though, to fight this spiritual battle. Because in the same chapter, verses 13 through 18 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So right here, I mean, just to touch on some of these, because this could be a whole sermon in itself, but I mean, as far as the whole armor of God, right? That we're supposed to have the whole armor of God, standing firm in the Lord, fasting on the belt of truth, having the breastplate of righteousness, having the gospel of peace, the shield of faith that we're to carry at all times, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. 
And it says praying at all times in the spirit. Being in prayer during those spiritual battles. Again, asking the Lord for wisdom, for knowledge, for strength throughout whatever you're going through in your life. Asking him for perseverance in that Christian walk. Because we're supposed to be keep alert and persevere. <clears throat> so I want to encourage you today to stand firm in the Lord. To stand firm in the truth of the gospel, not being deceived by the lies of the world or any of the false teachings that are out there, right? Of all these different false religions that are out there. But stand firm in, the, in knowing that God's divine power gives us everything that we need to live a, live a godly life. God's divine power gives us everything that we need to live a godly life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, that's exactly what it says. It says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. I mean, God's divine power has granted to us everything that we need for this life and for godliness, to live a godly life, a life that's pleasing to Him, that's glorifying to Him. And that comes through the knowledge of him, getting to know him, to getting to know how he strengthens us, how he equips us, how he gives us peace, how he gives us joy. Because we are here to glorify him, right? So stand firm in the Lord. And another way that we could stand firm is by staying in fellowship with one another, right? Motivating each other, living life with each other, encouraging each other to stay strong in the Lord. And also, just like the Church of Philippi had their leaders, Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, I mean, for you guys that go to church, you guys have your church leaders, right? To always go to. To always ask, you know, about things that are happening within your life. And they'll always point you to Christ. They'll always point you to God. They'll always strengthen you through the Word of God. And they'll give you that godly advice in order how to live your life in a way that's glorifying to God, right? Whatever you're going through, you could talk to them. You could... They'll encourage you in Christ Jesus. So you see, when you're in Christ, you have the ability to stand firm against the deceptions of this world. You have the ability to overcome the trials that come within your life, the temptations that come within your life that you'll face. And then you have the ability also to overcome those spiritual battles that you will encounter within your life. And throughout all of this, I mean, the Lord... He'll also give you his peace, though. He'll give you his joy within your lives. Which brings me to my second point, which is when we're in the Lord, we have the ability to stay joyful and rejoice. When we're in the Lord, we have the ability to stay joyful and rejoice. Let's go ahead and read this in verses 4 through 9. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So we see here in verse 4 that God's word to us is to rejoice in the Lord always. To rejoice in the Lord at all times. Not just sometimes, but every single time. And this is so important, though, because when we focus on these words that are here on, in the first sentence of verse 4, what that does, it really paves the way for our Christian lives. And when it says to rejoice in the Lord always, again, this is not a suggestion, but it's a command to us as Christians. And God gives us the command because he knows that when we find our joy within him, that we'll be satisfied, that we'll be full, that we'll you know, we won't be longing for anything else. And the joy that we have in him, it's sufficient. It's enough for our lives. 
it will give us that peace and true joy. And you'll notice here in verse 4 that it doesn't say, hey, rejoice in how much money you have, right? And that's because money can't bring true happiness. It can't bring true joy. But we could also see that, I mean, if we look at the world today, that you see some of the people out there that have a lot of money, right? They have all kinds of things, all kinds of toys, houses, cars, friends, most likely because they have money. But I mean, deep down inside, they're empty. They have this void within their heart, within their lives. And they're always trying to fill that void. They're going after the next thing. They're trying to fill that void. They fill it up for a little bit, but then it empties out, it drains out. And they're trying to fill it up again just to get happy, just to have joy. But really in the end, they're depressed. But I mean, this doesn't just relate to money. I mean, we're not to find our joy within people or materialistic things, right? Our alcohol, our drugs, or anything else. Because those things will leave you empty. They'll fill you for a time, but then it drains out, and then you're trying to go after it again. You're trying to go out. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. But I mean, that just leaves you empty. It leaves you depressed. It leaves you longing for something. And it leaves you sad. It leaves you broken. And they're not, it will not bring your soul true satisfaction. But it's when we find our joy in the Lord, that's when we can remain joyful. And that's because our joy is not based on any relationships. Our joy is not based on, you know, circumstances or materialistic things that will fade away. Our joy is not based on how much money we have or how much money we don't have, right? But our joy is rooted, it's grounded in the Lord, and we have so much to rejoice, rejoice for in the Lord. I mean, don't we? I mean, I know I do. And I know most of you guys do as well. And for me, just to name some of those things that I rejoice for in the Lord, first is God's grace. God's amazing grace. Because by His grace, He opened my eyes to see my sin for what it was. He opened my eyes, even, even though... He always knew my sin for what it, what it is, you know, and truly what it was, evil, wretched. He knew my sin. But I mean, he opened my eyes to understand and notice that I was sinning towards a holy, righteous God. That I was evil. That I was wretched. And the only thing that I brought to him was my sin. And so by him opening my eyes to see that and just how you know, unloving I was to people, how I didn't really care about people, how I could, I could really, honestly, I could say I could really care less about other people. I only cared maybe about my immediate family, and that's it. So I was not loving, and, but at the same time, hey, I called myself a Christian. I went to church, but he opened my eyes to see that I was living this hypocritical life, that I was claiming Christ with my mouth, but denying him with my life. But I also rejoice for his forgiveness because through him opening my eyes to see my sin, I repented of that sin and he forgave me of my sin. He cleansed me, he purified me, he washed me clean because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't bring it in up anymore. He doesn't condemn me for my sin but he forgives me for my sin. So I rejoice in that. And I also rejoice in God's love, right? Because, <clears throat> I mean, when it was right there. I remember just right there, just understanding who I was, being exposed and fully vulnerable to the almighty God. And through that repentance and him totally forgiving, forgiving me, and just feeling his love poured out upon my life. And just, I, I mean, you can't even really explain or describe that love or that feeling. It's not, it's, it's, it's just like, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just God poured out his love of forgiveness upon my life. Blessing me with the gift of salvation in his son. And I re also rejoice that God's given me his Holy Spirit 
the Holy Spirit that indwells my soul at the moment of salvation, that lives within me to strengthen me in my Christian walk, to encourage me through the word of God, leading me, guiding me in my life, convicting me of sin, teaching me again, opening my minds to the scriptures so I could walk in the spirit, walk in him, glorifying the Lord with my life, new life now that I have in Christ Jesus. And of course, all of this is only possible because of Jesus, my Savior. So I also rejoice in him. That he came down, he humbled himself. He was born. Right? He lived that perfect life that he gave me in place of my wretched life. And he died on the cross for all of my sins. And that sin is gone. And then when he died, he con after he died, he conquered death, right? He rose again. And he victorious over death. And I also rejoice that he's in heaven right now, sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning in full control. I also rejoice that in his commands, his instructions that he left his church, right? The word of God, so that we might know him personally, for us to grow in our knowledge of him. So we know the things that pleases him, right? To grow in our understanding of who our Lord is. I also rejoice knowing that he will return for his church one day and that we'll be with him forever and ever and eternity. I mean, that's so awesome knowing that. I mean, how can't we just rejoice in that, knowing that we have salvation in Christ and that we'll be with him for all eternity? And the list goes on and on and on. So there's so many things that we could rejoice for in the Lord. And the awesome thing is these things that we rejoice in, they're not going to fade away. They're not temporary. They're not going to grow old where we have to get the new, best, newest thing. But we find our joy in the Lord. And they'll last forever. Because of course, God is eternal, right? And what's when we set our minds on what the Lord has done, it brings true happiness within our lives to our souls. And we're also able to live that out. Like it says in verses five through nine. Let's look at it. Verse five, it says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. So another way it's saying is let your gentleness be known to everyone. And the way that we could do that is because we've experienced as Christians, as citizens of heaven, God's gentleness upon our life, God's grace within our life, God's love within our life. So we first experience and get that from the Lord and we see his love and it's through that that where we can live our lives and be loving towards other people, be gracious towards other people. And so it's being known to everyone, right, for us to reflect Christ from our lives. And verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And so here it says, I mean, us as Christians, we know we still get anxious. You know, we still feel that anxiety. But we need to be obedient to God's word. It says, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer, pray about everything. Right? I mean, that's where we could come before the Lord with everything that we have. And it says, let your request be known to God. Where we could come before his holy throne. We could pour out our heart to him. We could pour out everything that's on our minds. Everything that's happening within our lives. And we could lay it before him. And we could ask him for wisdom. We could ask him for knowledge through what we're going through. We could ask him to lead us and guide us within the trial, with whatever you're facing within your life. You have access to God Almighty, the one that's ruling and reigning over everything, that's in full control of everything. So that's why it says don't be anxious because he is in full control, right? Even though we might not be in control of our lives at times, he's always in control. So we could pour out our hearts to him. In verse 7, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so here, 
we see that God's peace, he gives us a peace that we can't even explain, that we might be going through the hardest time within our lives, but we could still know that we are at peace with God. And we could have that peace. And that peace that we have when, you know, when we're going to him and he, we lay out everything before his throne and before his feet, he'll mold and shape our hearts to, to change them, to, to align with his will and what he wants, what he desires. Because he, that's what he's doing. He's molding our lives. He's shaping us. He's conforming us to the image of his son. Right? So what we're doing is we're growing in the Lord. We're being sanctified to become more like Christ. So it's not always easy. Yeah, sometimes it's painful because we still deal with this flesh, right? But we want to be more like Christ. And being more like Christ, we have to continue to die to our flesh. But in that, God will give us his peace, right? And he'll guard our hearts. He'll guard our minds. And in verse 8, it says, Finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and God of peace will be with you. And so we see here this true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellence, worthy of praise. I mean, we look at all these things, and we could describe, I mean, God's all these things. God's true. God's honorable. God's just. God's pure. Right? He's worthy of all praise. So let's set our minds and think on the Lord. Fill our minds with the Lord. Fill our minds with the scriptures. So you see, when we have salvation in the Lord, we have the ability to stay joyful. Because again, our joy is not found in anything else, but it's found in God. And again, no one can take that away from us. No matter what you're going through, the hardest thing, if you find your joy in the Lord, nobody could take that from you. Nobody could remove that joy from you because nobody could steal it, nobody could ruin it or destroy it because it's in the Lord. But not only do we have the ability to stay joyful when we're in the Lord, we also have the ability to stay strong in our Christian walk when we're in the Lord. Which brings me to my last point for this evening. We have the ability to stay strong no matter what the circumstances look like within our lives. We have the ability to stay strong no matter what the circumstances look like within our lives. Let's see this in verse 10 through 13. It says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, verse 13 it's one of the most well-known verses of the Bible, right? But unfortunately, some, some people take this verse and they take it out of context and they put their own meaning on the verse. And they tend to misuse the verse. They tend to think that, you know, this is a promise where they'll have some kind of, you know, superpowers or, um, you know, they're invincible. They, could, they can just be immune to any issues or any trials that come within their life or that, you know, they could just do something and conquer something if they just put their mind to it, if they just set their mind to it. But instead, what Paul's telling the Philippian church is that through their faith in Jesus Christ, they will be strengthened in the Lord. They'll be strengthened in the Lord to faithfully endure whatever arises within their lives. And Paul himself could testify to this. I mean, if some of you guys know, some of you guys know what Paul went through. I mean, he went through all kinds of things, right? But we could let me just go ahead and read some of these difficult times that he had within his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 24 to 27. The apostle Paul writes, "Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. 
Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day. I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. So we see here some of the things that the Apostle Paul went through. And he went through these things because he preached Christ. Because he lived a life for Christ, dedicated to Christ. And people didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to hear about the gospel. And we see here that five different times, and he was whipped 39 times. He was beaten with rods, and he was stoned. And he was stoned when he was stoned, that's when he was preaching the gospel. He's preaching Christ. He was stoned and he was drugged out of the city, left for dead. But then he got back up and he went right back into the same city and preached the gospel. Because his life was Christ. He loved Christ. He loved his Savior. But we see everything else that he took, that the difficult times that he had within his life. But he persevered in his Christian walk. And back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through 13, we could see how Paul handles these hard times within his life. So verse 11 of Philippians chapter 4 says, Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So we see here that Paul has learned the secret. The secret of facing these difficult times within his life. But what's that secret? The secret is being in Christ Jesus. By being, by having salvation in Christ Jesus. By having Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And he knows it's because he's now strengthened by the Lord. He's now equipped by the Lord. And that word strengthen in the Greek there, what that means is to put power in or put strength in. And so the Apostle Paul, what he needed, he he needed strength from the Lord. So whatever situation he was in, God empowered him to face those difficult times within his life. He strengthened him. He gave him the power. He gave him the strength to encounter all these different difficult times. And so what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that by being in the Lord, he now has the ability to stay strong. Again, regardless of whatever he faces. And it doesn't matter if he's going through a good time within his life or if there's hard times like the ones that we just read. I mean, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are what comes up within his life because he can go through all things because Jesus will give him the strength that he needs to go through those times. And the power that he receives from the Lord is the powering of the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within him. And in the Apostle Paul's case, the strength that he was given was to serve as a missionary, right? Despite whatever difficult times, whatever intense, difficult times that he faced. That was the strength that he was given so he could accomplish accomplish God's will for his life as a missionary. But it's the same for us Christians today. Because we can have the same strength. The same strength is available to us. You know, whether you're serving in another country or whether you're serving within your own community, or maybe you're serving at church, or you just, or you need the strength to resist temptation, right? Or you need the strength to face whatever trials come up with in your life. Christ's power will enable us to stand firm on his promises and to stay joyful in him. And he will give us the strength to endure any circumstances within our lives. So I encourage you, seek the Lord. Stand firm in the Lord. 
Find your joy in the Lord. Find your strength in the Lord. Because he will give you everything that you will ever need for your Christian life. And then you'll have the ability to overcome any spiritual battle that comes within your life. Yeah, it might be hard, but continue to dig your heels in. Continue to persevere within the battle with the strength of the Lord, with his might. Not on our own strength, but in the Lord's strength. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this evening, God. I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you will just um, equip us, empower us for this Christian life. That we, not, we might not find our strength or our joy or our peace in anything else, in anyone else, but we may focus on you because you give us everything that you need, Lord. You're sufficient for life and for godliness. So Lord, strengthen us, equip us, lead us, guide us in your will for your glory, Lord. God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.